Well, since we're just a few weeks into the new year, I thought I would prepare you for difficult people. Hi, I'm Ron Carpenter. I want to welcome you to Ron Carpenter Television. You know what? I, uh, I just believe so much that God always exceeds himself and there's always something God can do that exceeds the last thing he did. But things stand in the way and the things that stand in the way are usually people. Uh, you know, Galatians, Paul asked him, he said, who has bewitched you? And the Bible also said in Romans 8, who can stand against? It's, all, it's, it's never a what, it's always a who. And if we don't learn how to deal with difficult people in life, the chances are our lives are going to be pretty miserable because you can't control everybody else. The only thing you can control is you and your response. This is a powerful, powerful series I'm about to unlock and unveil to you. And we've gotten a ton of feedback on it. And I can't wait to get into the meat of it. And let's see what God's going to say. Are you ready? We can be successful, but we've got to learn how to handle difficult people. Matthew 7, 16 through 20. You will know them by their fruit. I could stop right there and dismiss y'all. You will know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree <clears throat> bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. How do I know if they'll be a good friend? How do I know if I need to date them? How do I know if I take the relationship to the next level? How do I know if I'm supposed to marry this person? How do I know if I open up my heart and allow them? And how do I, you will know by their fruit. You cannot fool me forever. The fruit will eventually tell me what kind of tree it is. You can fool me for a day, you might fool me for a week, but eventually the fruit and the tree are going to run parallel and it's going to, the fruit tells on the tree. The fruit gives the identity of the tree away. I may not be able to tell by looking at the tree, but eventually the fruit will tell me what's inside you. So you will know by the fruit. Let me really read Galatians 5, verses 22 through 24. But the fruit, somebody said, you'll know them by their fruit. Say it, you'll know them. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, verse 23, gentleness, self-control. You will know them by their fruit. The fruit, what fruit? I'll know them by what fruit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Lord, bless the reading of your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. All right, we talk a lot to each other in this church. Tell your neighbor on both sides, say, get ready, get ready, get ready right here. Here we go. <laughs> Disappointment is the child of false expectations. If you've ever been disappointed, it's because you put an expectation on something or someone and it failed to meet it, or they failed to meet it. If I were to pass a microphone around this building, the vast majority of people and I were to ask, what are you, what do you look, what do you, would you look for in a spouse if you decided to get married one day? What kind of things would you look for in a good friend? What kind of things would you look for in a guy you wanted to date or a girl that you'd like to go out with? I guarantee you these are the kind of things that would happen. After 30 years in ministry, I would hear this. I would hear things like, I want somebody fun loving. <laughs> I want someone adventurous. I want someone with a sense of humor. I want someone who loves intellectually stimulating conversations. <laughs> I want someone who's in touch with their emotions. Have you heard all these things? And I could go down the list, and we probably would be guilty as a church for naming the same type traits. However, none of those things I just listed have to do with character. None of them. 
If you go to Proverbs 31 and read The Virtuous Woman, you won't find personality traits. You see character traits. If you go to 1 Corinthians 13, none of those are a feeling. All of them are a list of commitments. Now, we start talking about these personality traits, and then we have these personality traits, which for the most part, especially some of our younger generation, is what we look for to qualify those we are in a relationship with. And then we wonder why in the end we end up so heartbroken. And then after heartbroken, we end up so bitter. And then we end up numb. And then we end up emotionally shut down. Then we end up, we won't let anybody else in our life. And then we end up alone. And all these other things begin to happen to us. And it all started with, we've got our list of people that we will say, God, you go get them for what they did for me. But did you ask something of the relationship it was not designed to give? Because when you ask something of a relationship and you put weight on it, that it was not designed to hold up, you're the one that's going to get hurt. And then we blame them for hurting us as though they are bad people when you may have put an expectation on the person that God never designed them to be under. And you are the one that gets disappointed. And it doesn't mean they're a bad person. It means we had a misplaced expectation and the disappointment was sure to follow. Can I keep going right here? (laughs) The Bible says that when we accept Jesus in our heart, that the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of us and lives. That's right. He lives on the inside of us. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit brings with him two different things. He brings, first of all, gifts. He brings gifts. The Bible talked about what her, uh, what her testimony talked about. The Bible talked about tongues, the interpretations of tongues. The Bible talks about prophecy. Prophets just aren't on stages. Prophets just aren't weird people. God can give you a moment, a gift of prophecy, and God can give you a snapshot of your son or daughter's future and then bring you back into reality and let you know a decision you may need to make now to protect their tomorrow. That's the spirit of prophecy. The Bible said he'll give you words of wisdom. He'll enlighten you into things you don't know. The Bible said he'll give you words of knowledge. He'll give you information that you couldn't learn. It came from the inside instead of the outside. The Bible says that God will give you gifts of faith. There's some people that just have the faith to believe God for anything. And you and you think they're just more spiritual than you. But it's a gift. It's a gift of faith. The Bible says there's gifts of healings. There are people that can do anybody they get around and touch them. That some, a tumor is going to dry up and a disease is going to break and a curse is going to come off them. They just walk around with that gift. And there's other people with gifts of miracles. And all these things come with the Holy Spirit. I ought to have a Holy Spirit altar call right now. Why would you not want the kind of Holy Spirit that lives inside of you and gives you these kind of gifts? However, here's the dilemma. The nature of a gift does not show me how much you love God. It shows me how much God loves you. My gift is not for me. My gift is for you. My gift is to strengthen you, encourage you, grow you, mature you in your faith, and make you great, and help you reach your God-given potential. And so God gave me this gift for you. And if I ever started using it on myself, I have then abused my gift. Abused. So my gift is for you. The problem is when you see me in my gift, you say, he must really love God. But me operating in my gift tells you nothing about my love for God. Because God gave me this gift. Oh, I'm preaching real good right now. So when you see people operating in a great gift and people are getting healed, but their lifestyle does not seem to quite live up to the measure of their gift, we get confused. But you've got to understand when God gives a gift, he said his gift and his call is without repentance. When he gives it, he doesn't take it back. So the gift shows you how much God loved them. It doesn't particularly tell you how much they love God. But the Bible says the Holy Spirit has something else. The Bible says he has fruit. Whole different story. Fruit is the result of intimacy. I just read to you the fruit of the Spirit. Those are character traits that an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit develop, and they are impossible outside of intimacy. So it's not when I see you operating in a gift, I know how much you love God, but when I see you loving and peaceful and joyful and kind and gentle and long-suffering and self-control, when I start seeing those things on the inside of you, then that's what shows me how much not God loves you, that shows me how much you love Him back. We got to quit looking at personality 
personality profiles and oh he looks so good when he rides that motorcycle and his hair just blowing in the wind mom I think he's the one he's the one oh let me tell you something you'll be like Delilah wanting to cut his hair off when you find out what he ain't got and what when he's mean that hair gets real ugly oh mama she the one she's in them heels and she walking so I just love her ankles let me tell you ankles get ugly quick when you find out they got an ugly heart character assessment everybody can have my gift everybody everybody had Jesus' gift he ministered to the multitudes everything he had he poured it out but that was his gift Jesus gave his gift to anybody who would crowd and multitude around him the Bible says he healed all that were sick and afflicted of the devil. All of them. But he only gave his life to 12. Everybody can have my ministry. Everybody can have my gift. But everybody can't have me. People will take the fact that you're a Christian and use it against you. I thought you were a Christian. I thought you were supposed to love people. I do love you, but I don't trust you. Thank you. You can get somebody to acting crazy and you begin to honor them and you can change the whole way that they're acting in the building. You can change their behavior by honor. You can access greatness by honor. You can take somebody that everybody's given up on them and you can begin to honor them. Living a life of honor is something that everyone should want to do. In this series, The Code from Ron Carpenter, you'll learn how honoring others attracts a blessing from God. It's amazing how God will take a treasure and say, I'm going to make you honor something that you don't like I'm going to make you honor somebody that hadn't treated you well and then when you operate in honor all of a sudden God unlocks something on the inside of them that can turn around and bless you this seven message series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call in the next 10 minutes and we'll include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. I've been commanded to love everybody. I have no choice. I've been so touched by love, it's an overflow, and it flows out into all my brothers and sisters. And I've been commanded to love you. But I have not been commanded to trust you. Trust is earned, and trust has to be qualified for. And trust is qualified by character. And character has to do with intimacy with God. So when you have a deep personal relationship with God, the fruit of the Spirit becomes the children or the offspring. In other words, everybody begins to look at those character traits and they begin to qualify you as somebody that is a safe person and somebody that you can open yourself up to and be in a relationship with. Now here's the difficulty with relationships. If I take off running to my left and your right, I won't run straight ahead into that wall. If I miss the doors and I just take off running straight ahead, I'm going to hit that back wall. Same if I go to my right and your left. Why? Because when this building was built, it was built with boundaries. Because it was built to house people. The freeways and interstates, they have boundaries. They have, there's curbs. There's barriers. There's walls. There's what to keep you in a proper lane. Yards have boundaries. If you live in a condo and apartment, there's walls between you and your neighbor boundaries. Now, having said that, here's the problem with relationships. They have boundaries too, but they're invisible. So they have to be drawn internally. You have got to avoid disappointment. Who is this person? What is my relationship to them? And what are the boundaries that define that relationship? You don't tell secrets to an acquaintance. I'm amazed at two people that will go through a divorce and share one cup of coffee at Starbucks and start pouring, pouring pain and hurt out on a table that they have just met. That person has not qualified for that information. 
They do not deserve that level of information. Okay, some of y'all didn't clap. I'm going to come back in a minute. I'm going over here. They've not qualified. You don't tell secrets to an acquaintance. Well, then what's the difference between an acquaintance and a friend? And where's the line? When have they crossed over? You don't sleep with friends. Yes. California, we don't sleep with friends. Why? Because you're going to get hurt. Because you are putting weight on that relationship it was not designed to support. Your heart is going to get broken and there's a load of pain headed your way. That is the most intimate connection in the world. God says, I have boundaries for it. It's called a covenant. But why are the boundaries there? For your safety. Because somebody loves you and somebody cares about you and somebody is sick of seeing you sit in a room and cry because your heart was broken again. Yes, sir. <laughs> Every relationship has lines. Who is the person? How have I defined them? What classification? And then what are the boundaries that define them? You do not go to work to get emotional support. Your job, well, that don't work for that company. Your, your job is not meant for your emotional support. Do you want me to tell you what your job is? Pay me. Pay me. I give you my skills, I give you my knowledge, and I trade it because we're trying to accomplish something as a company. Pay me. It is not your counsel. It's not where you go to hook up. It's not where you go to find a husband. It's not where you go for counsel. It's not where you go for wisdom. Pay me. You are putting a weight on that company. It was not designed to handle. And then you leave talking about what a bad company it is because it did not give you wisdom. It's not the company's fault. You placed an expectation on it. It was not designed to meet. Constituents. Sounds like a non-biblical, non-churchy word. Constituents. There'll be people that'll come in and out of your life because a constituent, they're not in it for you. They're in it because they're for what you are for. And the cause brought you together. It was a constituency that created this. And they came together and they were for the same thing. They wanted to reach the same goal. They wanted to change the world with a mechanism. And they accomplished it. But they're not all best friends. They came together because they are for the same thing. You should work with a group of constituents where you are all for a common goal, but don't place more on it than it's designed to give. These relationships are usually temporary, and usually once the goal has been accomplished, many times the relationships dissolve because they were not into you, they were into what you were for. There's comrades. Flip it. They're not into you either, but they are against what you're against. You are comrades against cancer. You are comrades against poverty. You are comrades against homelessness. You are comrades against addiction. What brought us together? We don't even know each other's name, but we are here because there's a cause. What, what should we be here? We should be constituents and comrades. I'm here as a constituency because I am for everybody in the Bay Area knowing Jesus Christ is their personal Savior and knowing the blessing and the life and the kingdom that we're talking about. And I'm against sin and I'm against hurt and I'm against depression. Come on. And I'm against addiction and I'm against brokenness and I'm against weariness and I'm against tiredness and I'm against poverty. And we are a whole bond of constituents and we are a bond of comrades together in the kingdom. But here's this third one. Confidant. James chapter 5, put it on the screen if you would please. Confess your trespasses, another translation says weaknesses, to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Wow. Well, I don't want to tell that stuff to people I barely know. 
I certainly don't want to go into an arena and grab a microphone and just spray my faults all over the arena. So what is he talking about? The Bible says from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth is where the heart ventilates itself. Do you know what most depression is? Yes, there's clinical depression. Yes, I'm sure there's chemical things, and I'm not qualified on any level to debate that. But as a minister, do you know what my experience, most depression is? And it don't care how much money you have or don't have or what color you are. Depression does not discriminate. Depression is most of the time this right here. I never got to talk. I never got to talk. It started as anger, and anger is short and seasonal because anger is too intense to be sustained. So it starts as anger, and because the anger never was ventilated, you internalize it. And that becomes a state, not a season, a state of depression. Because something happened to the heart, and the mouth never let the pain breathe. Because we don't have confidants. We don't have people who have qualified with enough fruit that I can sit down and tell you the thing that aches in my soul and know that you're not going to turn around with that information at a later, later date and try to harm me with it. Confidence are not normally flashy. Fight you. In fact, you might even say they're boring. But you can take the secrets of your heart and let your heart breathe because they have such fruit and character that when you speak of your weaknesses, it falls on ears that care, but on lips that never repeat. They become the place where your heart nurses itself back to health. Because you're confident in your confidant. They qualified to hear that information. And you told them and you went away with a heart that was lighter because they're the kind of person that makes you feel safer. <laughs> Maybe, just maybe, we're hurt, broken, damaged, wounded, depressed, and the list goes on. Not because they're bad people, but because we never qualified them for the access we gave them. You can get somebody to acting crazy and you begin to honor them and you can change the whole way that they're acting in the building. You can change their behavior by honor. You can access greatness by honor. You can take somebody that everybody's given up on them and you can begin to honor them. Living a life of honor is something that everyone should want to do. In this series, The Code from Ron Carpenter, you'll learn how honoring others attracts a blessing from God. It's amazing how God will take a treasure and say, I'm going to make you you honor something that you don't like, I'm going to make you honor somebody that hadn't treated you well, and then when you operate in honor, all of a sudden God unlocks something on the inside of them that can turn around and bless you. This seven-message series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call in the next 10 minutes and we'll include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. You know what, guys? I just, um, I come to you at the end of these programs every time because, as you know, we are a viewer and listener-supported. 
And uh, I come for two groups of people. Number one, to say thank you for those that have been doing this with us a very, very long time. It's been a wonderful journey. I mean, we just, a little camcorder in the back of a plywood box with some carpet stapled to it. That was our TV ministry and just some local programming whenever we could buy it, whenever we could afford it, to now you've allowed us to take the message of Jesus and his kingdom to the whole world. Who made that happen? God made it happen and God used you. And I am grateful. And I also want to tell you thank you for all of our supporters. I need your prayers. My family needs your prayers. This ministry needs your prayers. Even our new assignment from our pastorate, our broadcast area in the Bay Area of California. We believe we're even here to unlock regions and do things for God that has never been done before. I want to thank you for your giving. I want to thank you for your support and thank you for your help. I want you to tell your friends about us and let them watch and bring them in because we believe that we not only are just talking about Jesus, but the message of his kingdom. And when you get his kingdom, all these things are added unto you. I want to tell all, the, all, the, uh, all of you who may be watching and maybe you've never given to a ministry. Maybe you've been distrustful. I want to ask you to give God a try and give us a try. You know why? Because the fact is when you give, when you sow, you are giving into the ground of the only one qualified. Not everything promises return, but God says to the giver that he will be responsible to make sure that he gives the increase. And whether you're a first-time giver or not, maybe it's a one-time gift, or whether you'd like to be a part of the family, a covenant partner, I invite you in. We open our circle of love. And I have this gift to give back to you for whatever your first-time gift is. Of whatever amount, it doesn't matter. We just want to say thank you for letting us be a part of your life. And we do not take that lightly. Hopefully the word that is going forth is making an investment and making life better. Amen. I also want to invite you to connect with me on Instagram and connect with me on Facebook and all the other things you can do. iChurch on Sunday through our website. And go connect with me on Twitter because we're always talking, we're always saying, we're praying. God's giving me things. I'm doing staff meetings, doing all kind of stuff that we do live. And I want you to be a part of those things too. And also know that everything you hear here, all of them are available on our online bookstore by CD or DVD. And if you go get the Ron Carpenter app and download it, we've got a special library of 20 some years of teaching called The Vault. Check it out. A lot of good things are happening here. And this is gonna be a great year in your life. I just prophesied over you and will you agree with me that this is a year of more. All right, I'll see you again real soon. Join us every week for another exciting message from Ron Carpenter. And until then, visit us online at roncarpenter.com and discover encouraging resources to help you reach your greatest potential in your Christian walk. And when you visit, consider partnering with our ministry team to help us take this life-changing message to the world. Our goal is to take the message and ministry of Ron Carpenter to a worldwide audience, but we can only do it with your help. And don't forget to connect with Ron every day through social media. Thank you so much for being a part of this ministry, and we'll see you again next time for another challenging message with Ron Carpenter.